We're going to be in Exodus chapter 14. This will be the last of our studies in this section of God's Word. Uh, after we, I just, as I told you before, I just, reading through this time, I was so struck by the whole story of the Exodus that I thought it's been a long time since I've taught through it, so we'll do that, and God willing, next week we'll start in what I had previously promised but lied because I changed my mind, <laughs> and we'd, we'll we get started on the Gospel of Mark next time. Um, the major themes that we've been seeing throughout this study of the Exodus, not the book, we haven't studied the whole book, but studied just the actual Exodus, the, the plagues and all of that, the lengths that God will go to save his people. Who's glad? If you know, we sing a song sometimes, you did not wait for me, but you came to me. Praise God. And, and it's always that way. If, if, if God was waiting for any of us to come to him, he would wait in vain because as, as was prayed, uh, we are sinners by nature and sinners by choice and dead in sin and no one would ever choose to follow the Lord. But look at what he, God does to get his people Israel out of Egypt. We also, uh, a recurring theme, which will come up again tonight, is the hard-heartedness of Pharaoh. Why is it that it says, he hardened his heart, and then God says, I harden his heart. And I'm not going to stop each time this comes up tonight, because we've talked about it enough times. I just want to remind you, when we come to one of those passages where God says, I harden his heart, remember what we've said about this. God doesn't actively harden people's hearts, meaning he doesn't tell them, I know you want to trust me and follow me, but I'm not going to let you. No, he does it passively by allowing sinful people to continue on the path of sin. And why is it that he actually causes the heart to be harder, even though it's passively? Because when sinners come into the presence of God, they don't like him. The more they hear of God and the more they hear of that they need to surrender to him the less they want to. So remember that as we go through. It's not only true of Pharaoh, it's true of every one of the godless, and it was true of each of us before we received Christ. And then the other theme that comes up over and over, and we'll see it tonight twice, is the fickle faithlessness of God's people. So we left off last time at the end of chapter uh, 13, uh, as God was leading the people by the pillar of fire and the pillar of smoke. And now we start with uh, Exodus chapter 14, verse 1. And where, was, where, did he, where did he lead them? The first place that he led them was to the Red Sea. Now, of course, we know the story, so we know that something big happens at the Red Sea. You might think, well, why did God lead them to the Red Sea? Well, we'll see what happens. One thing is it's going to mean that Pharaoh is going to change his mind. So chapter 14, beginning in verse 1, Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, that they turn and camp before pi Hiroth, between Migdal and the sea, opposite baal Zephon. You shall camp before it by the sea, speaking of the Red Sea. Here's why. For Pharaoh will say to the children of Israel, They are bewildered by the land. The wilderness is closed in on them. Then, here it is, I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them. There's two goals that God has in mind always in uh, what he does for people. The first one he says, he says, I will gain honor over Pharaoh. It's for his glory. I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his, harm, his army. And the second thing is and the, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. God is a God, I always say, of self-disclosure. He wants to reveal himself. He does reveal himself to his people. And he even reveals much of himself to those who are not his people, which results in them usually hardening their hearts. And if, they, if their hearts get softer, it's because he has done that. So, and, and, they did, and they did so, verse 5. Now it was told to the king of Egypt that the people had fled, and the heart of Pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people. Remember when they left, they were saying, just go, and here, take the gold, just, just go. But then he thought, I'm losing my workforce, and he didn't want to surrender to God. So he said, why have we done... So he turned against the people, and they said, why have we done this? 
Why did we let them go? How quickly people forget. Why, did, why have we done this? That we have let Israel go from serving us. So he made ready his chariot and took his people with him. He also took 600 choice chariots and all the chariots of Egypt with the captains over every one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh. Again, it's a recurring theme throughout all of this. Um, God's presence softens the hearts of those who are redeemed, and God's presence hardens the hearts of those who are in rebellion against him. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and he pursued the children of Israel. We know this. And the children of Israel went out with boldness. Uh, so the Egyptians pursued them. All the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen and his army, overtook them, camping by uh, the sea besides Pi Hieroth before Baal Zephon. So they're by the Red Sea, and there's just the markers of where they were. The next section, verses 10 through 14, the Israelites' faithless response. Response to what? They're probably feeling pretty good, feel, feeling pretty special that they were out of Egypt and they were leaving laden down with all this wealth that the Egyptians said, here, go and take it. And uh, remember, they were complaining against Moses throughout the whole time. Uh, you, you know, before they were going to be let go, they didn't, weren't sure. But boy, once it happened, they're all excited. And then they stopped and camped. And here comes Pharaoh and the chariots. So their faithless response. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children lifted their eyes. And behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid. Notice what they did. Now, again, I know this is a figure of speech to say they lifted their eyes, but there's, there's something that I think we can learn from this. Where were their eyes that caused them to lose heart and to get scared and to be filled with fear? They were looking at the enemy instead of at their Lord. They were looking at the enemy. They were looking at the circumstance. The, the scripture is filled with stories like this. One of the more well-known stories in the gospel is, is Peter walking on the water with his eyes on Jesus, but then he turned and looked at the waves and boom, he began to sink. This is the same kind of thing here. Eyes on the enemy, eyes on the problems, eyes on the circumstances instead of on the Lord. And what happens? They're very afraid. Now it says the children of the Lord cried out to the Lord. The excuse me, the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. I just say, really? It says they cried out to the Lord, but you know, people, there's two different ways people cry out to the Lord. Well, three, if you count shaking their fists. People cry out to the Lord because they want more of him. And people cry out more, cry to the Lord because they want more from him. You see the difference? When we cry out to the Lord, we should be crying out because we want more of him, not just more from him. Well, they were in trouble. And so they did cry out to the Lord. But then they said to Moses, because... There were no graves in Egypt. Have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? So it's evident that they weren't crying out to the Lord in faith because they, then they immediately, oh no, all is lost, which I have a tendency to do. Probably no one else uh, when things don't go the way I want them to. Um, oh no, it's all is lost. We cry out to the Lord. But then immediately they start jumping on Moses' back and causing and. and accusing him of causing the problems. I, I, I think it's interesting. Look at how many times they, they address him. They cried out to Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we told you? We told you. We told you when you first came and said you were going to lead us out of Egypt. What are you talking about? They got excited when they got out, but now not so much. We told you, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians that we should, than we should die in the wilderness. They, they weren't crying out to the Lord in a legitimate manner because they wouldn't have been accusing. First of all, the Lord is the one who led them, not Moses. But people like to accuse the leaders you know, as it goes with the leader, sometimes it goes with the people. But sometimes when there's trouble, people, I, I used, to, used to say, you know, when people have trouble, they blame the, the pastor. And if the pastor's not good enough, they blame the church. And if that's not enough, they blame the pastor's wife. And then they blame the pastor's kids. 
and I'm assuming I don't know this one from experience. I know all the rest of those. Um, if we had a dog, they'd probably blame, blame our dog, you know, because it, something's wrong. Something goes wrong in your life, and it, we got to find someone to blame. And the easiest guy to blame is the leader. So they blame Moses, saying it would be better for us to have died in Egypt as slaves than to be out here. Really, really, would it have been better? Of course, we know what's going to happen, and God's going to deliver them from this pursuing army, and it's going to be better, better than better. But this is what happens when people are afraid and when people are squirming. Verse 13, and Moses said to the people, look at he tells them three things. One, do not be afraid. Two, stand still. See, uh, three, see the salvation of the Lord. Good, good words, good words. First of all, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. What then should we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Who shall lay charge against the elect of God? For it is Christ who died and rose for us. And for th they've seen God's strength. Don't be afraid. Stand still. Don't be so anxious that you need to feel like you need to do something all the time. And watch. See the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you will see again no more, and I love this, forever. Here's the thing. Enemies come and go. Problems come and go. The Lord is forever. The Lord is forever. Verse 14, the Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. This is a verse that I committed to memory many, many years ago. I was in the midst of a trial and I was anxious and worried and afraid and didn't know what to do. And it just so happened, you know, in the providence of God. Here's what happens when you read through the Bible constantly. God brings the verses across your path and minister to. And I'll never forget, there are times when the best thing to do is to shut it and let God handle it. Now, this does not mean that we're to be passive and stop being responsible. You know, we don't want to take this, the Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace, so I don't need to get a job, he'll send money to the, and food to the door. No, but when it comes to being anxious and being fearful, Hold your peace and watch. The Lord will fight for you. The Lord is always taking care of his children. He's invested so much in us. If, he, if he's given us his own son in Romans chapter 8, didn't withhold his own son, but gave him up freely for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? We need to be reminded of this. I know I do. Next section is Exodus 14, verse 15 through 31. God delivers Israel from Pharaoh at the Red Sea. Verse 15, and the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? <laughs> Tell the children of Israel to go forward, but lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And watch this. I indeed will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, not just Pharaoh, and they shall follow them. He says, I'm going to open the sea. The children of Israel are going to go through. And I'm going to harden the hearts and kind of numb the brains for them to, that they're going to follow and go through. For what purpose? So I will gain honor over Pharaoh. God's purpose is always for his glory. That I will gain honor over Pharaoh, over all of his armies, over his chariots and his horsemen. The second thing, then the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. This is what God has in mind in everything that he does. He wants us to, he wants us to glorify him for his greatness and his goodness and his love and his grace and all that he does to carry us. And he wants people to know that he is the Lord. Everything God does. Sometimes we don't know what God's purpose is in certain things that happen in our lives. You can always default to this. It's for his glory, and it's so that we would know him better. It's always for that. It's a simplistic answer, but it's a true answer. There may be other things that God has in mind and some of the things he does in our lives, but you can always count on these two. He wants us to give him glory, and he wants us to know him better. That's what it's about. When I have gained honor over, for myself over Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen, uh, this is when it's going to happen. I think it's interesting that he mentions not just over Pharaoh, but his chariots and his horsemen. These, these are weapons of war. 
you know, it's, it's not a bad thing for a nation to have weapons of war for the protection of their, their citizens. That's the number one thing that government is supposed to do is to, is to give the, their citizens law and order and safety. And that is also from foreign intruders. So it's not bad to have standing armies and those kind of things. But at the same time, ultimately, who are we to trust in? If you trust in horses, speaking of war, weapons of wars, they can't do it. God may work through them, but th them by themselves, they can't save us. They can't save us. Verse 19. And the angel of the Lord who went before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud went before them and stood behind them. Um, so it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. Thus it was a cloud and darkness to one, and it gave light and night, light by night to the other, so that the one did not come near the other all that night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind. All that night, this must have been quite a wind, and made the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. So the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, dry ground. And the waters were a wall to them on the right hand and on the left. It's interesting, just 19, 20, 21, and 22, four verses, and there's what it, the Bible has to say about the parting of the Red Sea. It's pretty simple for God. Send a wind, blow strong. He's, he's, got the, um, he's got their front and their back with the cloud, the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud. Blows the water out of the way, dry ground for them to go through. Well, what happens next? And the Egyptians pursued and went after them in the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. Now, can I just stop for a second and say, what the heck were they thinking? What were they thinking? Now, the children of Israel were with their backs against the sea, with the enemy pursuing them, and Moses explained, here's what's going to happen, and this is what happened. So at least they had, a, they had an idea what was going on. You know, the Egyptians didn't get, didn't get an email on this. They saw the Red Sea parting. They saw the Israelites going through. And now I'm just thinking from my own self, if I saw that, I'd be going, what is going on here? Is this another plague? I mean, they've just had their whole country decimated by these, these 10 plagues. And now they're seeing the waters part and the people go through. And in their spiritual delusion, they chased them. I think I would have been a deserter about that point. I'm not going. I'm not, I don't think I'm going through this. I'm not going through this. But they, they went. Why weren't they afraid? Pride. Spiritual delusion. Verse 24, Now it came to pass in the morning watch that the Lord looked down upon the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and cloud, and he troubled the army of the Egyptians, and he took off their chariot wheels so that they drove them with difficulty. And the Egyptians said, let us flee from the face of the Lord, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Now they were afraid, but it was too late because they were already out in the midst of it. They were already out in the midst of it. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea that the waters may come back on the Egyptians, on their chariots and on their horsemen. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea when the morning appeared. The sea turned to its full depth, returned to its full depth while the Egyptians were fleeing into it. So the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. Then the waters returned and covered the chariots, the horsemen, and all the army of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. And I just, at the end, this last sentence of that verse, not so much as one of them remained. You know, there's a, interesting sort of archaeological discovery that has been made in in our day uh, about where did this take place uh, if you're interested in these kinds of things archaeological things there's a, a couple of videos 
on um, YouTube, YouTube about the, the newly found, but at least believed to see, they, we can't say for sure, but it's believed to be the place where they crossed over. And there's a lot of work that's gone into this. One of the videos, I, I, I say this just because a couple of old friends of our church were involved in making it, uh, Lance Ralston and David Gusick made a video on this. They went there and they, they did the whole thing. And it's pretty fascinating. I know you guys know them and, and all. If you're interested in that sort of thing, I recommend it. It's quite interesting. It's quite interesting. It doesn't change anything if it is. It doesn't change anything if it isn't. It happened. But it is interesting when archaeology, and in this case, it's underwater archaeology because they go down and look and find things that look like coralized wagon wheels. It's pretty weird. So uh, if you're interested in those sort of things, I, I highly recommend it. Verse 29, but the children of Israel had walked on dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Verse 30, I love this. So the Lord saved Israel. Saved them from what? Well, they, they, they were saved from their bondage in Egypt when the exodus happened. But what, is this, what does this tell us about the Christian life? The exodus is a picture of, of a New Testament for us in the New Testament times. It's a picture of salvation. The salvations are similar yet vastly different. They were slaves to the Egyptians and they were delivered from that by God. But that's just a, a physical picture of a greater spiritual reality of being a slave to sin. But what's worse than being a slave in, in Egypt? How about having an eternity in hell to go to? But Jesus Christ, who is the greater prophet, similar to but much greater than Moses, being the Son of God, died on the cross for us, paying the penalty for our sins, and those who put their faith in him are saved from sin, death, and hell. That's what happened in the Exodus. But what happens after we're saved? All of our problems go away, right? Isn't that what happened to you? No, no. Sometimes it, sometimes it happens right away. Sometimes not so much, but it happens right away. For some, we're saved, and then there's a Red Sea that we have to deal with. But God, the Lord, saved them that day out of the hands of the Egyptians. Verse 30. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead by the seashore. 30, verse 31. Thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt. And now... Instead of murmuring and accusing Moses, very much like all of us, we tend to be unduly influenced by our circumstances. When they had trouble, they're angry, they're blaming Moses. We would have been better off to die as slaves. But now that they've been delivered from this onslaught of the Egyptians chasing them, what does it say in verse 31? Thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt, so the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. This is the Christian life. It's sad, but it's the Christian life. We, we all too often are like Israel. When things are going good and God is delivering, we're all happy. But then there's difficulties and we lose it. Part of our sanctification process is changing those highs and lows and highs and lows to be more of a constant, more of a constant. They're still there, but to be more of a constant. Well, what happens in chapter 15? Israel worships the Lord for this great victory. Well, what else would they do but worship the Lord for the great victory? It was clear, obviously, that it was him. Um, but these are the same people who just a, a few breaths earlier were rebelling before the victory. Once there was the victory, they're, they're praising the Lord. I'm not saying this to put them down. I'm, I'm saying this to say they're a picture of us all too often. Picture of me, maybe not you. So they sang this song and they sang a song of victory. The great rock and roll theologian, Tom Petty, 
in an interview was once asked, well, how do you make, why is it people love your songs so much? What's the secret to writing songs that everybody loves? Because it's really simple. Write really short verses and, and really fun choruses that people can sing along in the car. And then your, the, your songs will be hits. Well, I use that to set up what I'm going to do with this song. Uh, I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm not going to read the entire song. Just the repeating refrain. Just the choruses that you want to sing in the car. Okay? Um, because for them, the verses were all about Egypt. For us, the verses are what's going on in our lives that God is... And we need to look at this song and say, this is a song we can sing except for the verses are going to be different because we have different circumstances. But as they... Sing, a, sing out the praises to the Lord, followed by here's what he's done, and then back to praising the Lord because here's what he's done for us. We need to do the same thing. We praise the Lord because this is what he's done for us. We praise the Lord because this is what he's done for us. And the overarching thing that he did for them was deliver them from Egypt. And the overarching thing that he's done for us is infinitely bigger because he's delivered us from sin, death, and hell. So here's the, here's the chorus, verse 1. Then Moses and the children of Israel sang this song to the Lord. They weren't thanking their lucky stars or saying, my stars and marshmallows, aren't we happy that worked out? It's to the Lord. Sing to the Lord. Too many songs that are, I'm not saying that every song has to entirely be this way, but too many so-called worship songs don't even talk about the Lord. They just talk about us. But they sang to the Lord and they spoke saying, I will sing to the Lord for he has triumphed graciously. There's the chorus. We need to sing to the Lord for he has triumphed graciously. Think about how the Lord has triumphed and continues to triumph in your life because he's so good and so gracious. And then he goes on and tells about the horse and the rider and all that. And that's good, but for sake of time, I'm going to skip to verse 6. That was the verse. Here's the chorus. Your right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, has dashed the enemy in pieces. Once again, coming back to this repeating refrain, it's you, Lord, it's you. You have acted wonderfully on our behalf. And then after saying that, in verse 7 through 10, talks about what happened to them. And it's important for us to, to be aware of that, but... For us, when we're praising the Lord, like, what has he done for us? What has he done for us? And it's much. It's much. Verse 6, your right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, has dashed the enemy in pieces. Followed by another verse. Then we get to verse 11. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? There's the chorus again. It's about God. It's about God. And after that, in the beginning of verse 12, it's the verse of the song telling, here's what God did for them. And again, for you and for me, we have many things that, are, that we can say thank you to God for. And then the chorus strikes up again in verse 16. Fear and dread will fall on them by the greatness of your arm. Once again, extolling the Lord, singing to God about his greatness, followed by some more about uh, another verse about what was going on. And then in verse 18, the refrain repeats, the Lord shall reign forever and ever. Boy, that's a... There's a phrase we need to be reminded of. Forever and ever, meaning constantly. Not just longevity, but constantly. He's here. We need to be comforted and encouraged that he's here. And he's always caring for his people. Verse 19 and 20, again, a little bit more about what happened. And then the, the kind of the grand crescendo in verse 21 of this song. And Miriam answered them, sing to the Lord. Why? For he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. What was their biggest fear just before this? The horses and the riders, the chariots were coming, but God has done it. Can I encourage you? This is a good song to read, similar to like a, a psalm from the book of Psalms. 
but to remind us, season throughout your prayers, worship and praise to the Lord. It's, we don't just start with worship and then get in with our laundry list. Keep coming back to the Lord, for he has triumphed. His greatness should be the constant refrain of our worship is what I'm trying to say. For them, it was deliverance from a physical bondage in Egypt. For us, it's deliverance from spiritual bondage to sin and from hell. How much more do we have to be grateful for when we think of what God has done for us as Christians? Israel was constantly told throughout the, throughout the um, Old Testament, remember, do things to remember. Uh, do things to be reminded of what God has done for you. Um, remember what, that God delivered you from the Exodus. He, he tells them that over and over on that. I was preaching on that yesterday at the rescue mission to the men about the need for constant reminders because we, we have spiritual ADD. We forget. And we also have a problem of, we have heart problems. Not with the, the, the organ that pumps the blood, but with our hearts. Because he says in Deuteronomy, or excuse me, in Numbers, he says, you have hearts that tend towards spiritual idolatry. So be reminded, be reminded. As they needed to be reminded about this deliverance, we need to constantly be reminded, not that God saved us from slavery in Egypt, but that God saved our souls. Don't ever get, don't ever get blasé about your salvation, friends. Don't ever get, just because it maybe happened years ago, be just as excited today as you ever were. Well, so far what we've read tonight was about God delivering Israel from uh, the Pharaoh at the Red Sea. The last section of chapter 15, verses 22 through 27, I've entitled, God delivers Israel from thirst at a place called Mara. Delivered from bondage and delivered from the Pharaoh at the Red Sea. Little interruption for a praise event, the beginning of this chapter. And then the, the end of this chapter is God delivers Israel from thirst at Marah. So look at verse 22. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days into the wilderness and found no water. Again, remember, once you're saved, there's never any problems, right? There's never any challenges. It's just smooth sailing from here on out. No, they just had. They just got. They saw their enemies destroyed. They were delivered by God. They were fearing God. They were believing in God. They were trusting in Moses again. That's right, Moses. We were with you all the way. You know, even though just previously, why didn't we tell you this was you're crazy in the first? Now there's no water. Do you know how important water is? You can live without food for quite a while. It's not fun, but you can. You can't live without oxygen for very long at all. But right after oxygen, you can't live without water. It doesn't take that long to be dehydrated. As a matter of fact, if you're thirsty, you're already starting to be dehydrated. If you're hydrated healthy-wise, you'll never be thirsty unless you're eating pizza with a lot of pepperoni. That's an instant um, thirst starter. But they found no water. Problems, problems. There's, there's difficulties in the Christian life, friends. Even when you're being led by God. We don't, we're not led by God by a pillar of fire or a pillar of smoke, but we are uh, or a cloud. But we are led by God. We're led by God, the Holy Spirit who lives within us, the Word of God that guides and directs us. Um, and the fellowship of the saints where we encourage each other but there's still difficulties. Verse 23, now when they came to Marah, that was the place uh, where there was some water. So, oh good, there was no water, but now they come to Marah, oh good, there's water, but the water's no good. Do you ever have days like that? He's up, he's down, he's up, he's down, he's up, he's down. There was water there, but, verse 23, now when they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. 
you know, I, I, they hadn't been going for ever and ever, but I picture going through this desert scene and everything's still happy. And pretty soon it's like, you know, we're running out of the water that we're carrying. We need water. And they get to a place and there's no water. So then they get to a place where there is water and the water's no good. Therefore, the name of it was called, in verse, 30, verse 23, Mara, which means bitter. And the people complained against Moses. Big surprise. What shall we drink? It's understandable that they were upset because you can't go that long without water. When you're, when you're dehydrated, it's a problem. But in their case and in ours, whether it's water or going without something else, it's faithlessness. We forget. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Except for right now, God must be against us because we don't have water, and then when we have water, it's bitter. This is the kind of the way we, we roll sometimes. But God is doing this, these things to teach us and to show us that he takes care of us. What shall we drink? So he, Moses, cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. When he cast it, the tree, into the waters, and he says, stop for a second. The Lord must have, he doesn't say how it happened, but the Lord must have directed him. How would he think? Well, here's a tree. Let's throw this tree in the water and see what happens. You know, we can only imagine that the Lord led him to do this. He cast a tree into the waters, and the waters were made sweet. It wasn't the tree that did it. It's a miracle. This is why I can't help but believe God said, hey, Moses, see that tree? Cut it down. Throw it in the thing and it will be okay. And Moses, who was not a dumb man, probably thought, you know, he'd lived 40 years in the wilderness taking care of his father-in-law's sheep. He didn't come across any make bitter water sweet trees in all that time. I can't help but believe, and it doesn't, I know it doesn't say this, but I can't help but believe that God somehow impressed on him or told him, cut down that tree and throw it in the water, and sure enough. It's interesting at this point, some commentators liken this tree as a prefigurement of the cross. Life is bitter, but the cross. I don't know, maybe that's a stretch, maybe it's not, but it's interesting to consider. There he made a statute, continuing in verse 25, there he made a statute and an ordinance for them, and he testified, excuse me, and there he tested them. And said, verse 26, if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God to do what is right in his sight. Did you catch that? If you diligently, not passively, not without thought or just osmosis. No, you have to be diligent to heed the voice of the Lord your God and to do what is right. It's not enough to hear it. It's not enough to say, well, we go to a church that they open the Bible and preach in the Bible. Yeah, but are we doing what the Bible says? Well, I read the Bible every day. Yeah, but are, you, are we doing what the Bible says? God always adds doing to, to hearing or knowing it. So he says, heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right. Give ear to his commandments. Pay attention. But then what? Heed or keep all his statutes. And what does God say he will do if, 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 we, if they would do this? I will put none of the diseases on, which, on you which I have brought on the Egyptians. This isn't a, I don't believe this is an across the board. Um, there was a book that came out, I don't know, was it the 70s or maybe the 80s? None of these diseases it was a quote-unquote Christian book, and it said if you follow this particular diet, and you, you know you'll you won't have any diseases. This is hijacking scripture for money. Um, this happened specifically to them, but it's not a carte blanche that says if you do this, you'll never have a disease. Because you know what? Even Christians, it is appointed once for man to do what? To die. We all have an appointment with death because God wants to bring us to Himself. But don't forget, don't forget. As rough as death is for us. What does God say? Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. So he says, I'll put none of these diseases on you which, you which I have brought on the Egyptians. Why? For I am the Lord who heals you. And that is true. 
Even when he's working through doctors. I know I pray for people who are sick, whether they're in the hospital or not. And I pray whether by medicine or miracle, Lord, raise this brother or sister up because we know you're good and we know you're in charge of everything. Sometimes it's by medicine. Sometimes, hey, if you want to just miraculously cause them to not be sick anymore, that would be good. Either way, the Lord's the healer. Why do the doctors, you know, do you ever, do you, do you ever like me just sometimes marvel at the things that they do in, in medicine these days? I mean, you have to wait six months to get to see the doctor, but uh, <laughs> five years ago, 10 years ago, for sure, 20 years ago, many things that are just routine now, you would have died. It's the Lord. Who gives doctors and research physicians, etc., these these insights? It's not just because they're smart. They are. But it's the grace of God. The Lord is the one who heals us. Then they came to Elam, where there were 12 wells of water and 70 palm trees. So they encamped there by the waters. And once again, you see this? You see this? We're higher than a kite. We're out of Egypt. Wait, there's the Red Sea. We're not happy. But the Red Sea opens up and the pharaohs drown. And yippee, it's a worship time. But there's no water. And then when there is water, it's bitter. But God steps in again. As we are so faithful to be faith, faithless, God is faithful in spite of our faithlessness. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? I wrote in my notes, isn't this just like the Christian life? God miraculously saves us. We worship him. Then real life comes complete with troubles. And we waver back and forth between faith and worship and complaining and rebellion. Troubles are for our testing to reveal how much we will trust him while he continues to care for us. Let me just close by asking you to meditate on this question. Who here is thankful that when our faith is weak, our Savior is strong? Amen. Be encouraged, saints. Be encouraged. Father in heaven, we thank you for this little short detour of five Thursday nights talking about the exodus through the Mara of the bitter waters. I pray that this has been an encouragement to each of us. I know it has been to me. And I thank you for it, Lord. I thank you for it. God, may we not be those who hear the word or read the word, but fail to do it. And I put myself at the head of the list of, that I need to be reminded. I need to be reminded of who you are and all you've done for me so that I would waver less and be consistent in worship and faith more. Help us, Lord, because we're weak. And thank you for your kindness to condescend to us in our weakness. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.